Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Episode number 37 of the 9 to 5 Fitness Podcast. I'm really well. I slept really well. Gab, how are you? How did you sleep? I'm pretty good. Slept all right. It was like, I think I was asleep for six and a half hours of quality sleep. It's not good. It's all right. And uh, more importantly, my powerlifting medal finally came in the mail after three it months. Did. It took wait. a while. So I'm going to wear it the entire episode. So let's go. Yep. But we've got a big guest on. This is someone I looked up to when I started my gym journey. He was the first guy that I followed, pretty much the only guy. And I'd look at all of his Snapchat stories and I got like all of my information from him. There was some of the best like information out there that I still use to this day and it really just made like a great foundation of knowledge for me and I remember I'd send you all these stories when there'd oh, be like a really good piece of information they'd be like mate we should do this exercise or we literally this is off how it. you count calories so it's amazing to even think that we've got him on the podcast his name's Joseph Rakic he's one of the icons of the fitness industry Joseph mate how are you and how'd you sleep I'm doing good thanks guys um, thank you for having me and I slept awesome I've been having some pretty Pretty good quality sleeps lately. Um, not waking up during the night, so I think it's a win. <laughs> That's great. And is sleep something you really emphasize? I know. I remember on your Snapchat stories, you love getting up early, but is like I know you're a big grinder. But is sleep something you still emphasize? And is there a particular amount of hours you try to get? Hundred percent. Sleep is so important. Without optimal sleep, you're not going to be performing at your highest level, whether that's in work or training. Um, I. I recommend sleep a lot to a lot of people, but I'm probably the worst at following my own advice. <laughs> Just because I'm so busy, I'm so flat out. Uh, but at the moment, I feel like I'm in a pretty good sleeping schedule. That's good. I aim for at least six six hours minimum. I know it's not the best, but yeah, um, yeah. yeah. six hours minimum for me, and I'll, I'm happy. I remember seeing like Snapchat stories of you being up at like three a.m. or four a.m. and I was just like, mate, what, what time are you going to bed? Are you going to bed at like? 6 p.m.? <laughs> I just I just want to re-emphasize to everyone listening at home how much of a big kind of situation this is for us, Gab, because like we would be sending around Joseph's stories to like all our mates and stuff. Yeah. You were you got us all into it, Joseph, and um, this is just like a huge opportunity for us. So thank you, Joseph. But. When did you start, Gab, like with the, the, the Snapchat thing and, and like, let's just emphasize how big this is. I didn't start lifting weights until after year 12, pretty much. So I was 18, we kind of started our journey together and that's when I started learning all these tips and I, like, I was really keen on understanding the most efficient ways to progress, like the most scientifically optimized ways to train, to eat, supplementation, mm. recovery, everything like that. And Joseph was pretty much like, he did it all. He's like, I remember learning about creatine through him, about counting macros. I remember Joseph was really big on his ketogenic diet and I was like, no carbs and I was looking absolutely shredded. I wasn't necessarily big because I was starving my body. Yeah, and It wasn't time. good, but like I learned through trial and error that I needed to, yeah, it was just like elite. So definitely like 18 years old and yeah, I like there were other fitness influencers I think I followed like Callum Von Moger and stuff like that. But Joseph was like the best source of uh, accurate information I found. Yeah, yeah. I think um, just, just quickly like the... Joseph was probably one of the first people who, um, or influencers who we were watching who like weren't looking for a handout. I feel like every other influencer was putting out this information to get a bloody handout. Yeah. And it was almost offensive as a young 18 year old with 50 bucks in the bank. Joseph, when did you first start training? We'll get right into it. Jim, when did you first start hitting it? Um, I'm really bad with my time frames, but it would have been maybe when I was around 18, 19. Uh, my mum, she won a free gym trial she didn't want it, so she gave it to me. Um, I went along to the gym and, you know, it became like a social environment, hmm. hanging around with my mates there. Didn't know what I was doing, um, but, you know, after you muck around for a while, you start to see some progress. And when you see some progress, it makes you more interested, so you start researching about diet. You start researching about training. And then the more you apply that to you, the more changes you see, which only makes you do more research and more homework yeah. and train harder. Um, and it's just a circle like that. I think he's put it like so well. You just get addicted to the gains and you want to keep growing on top of that. So you keep researching and finding, oh, can I optimize anything a little bit better? Should I time my nutrients in a certain way? Should I do this and that? Just little one percenters that you slowly figure out. And yeah, you do get addicted to it and you slowly refine it into like this perfect 
routine if you mm. if you are kind of a cannibal and you really do care about your progress yeah create that addiction is the trick now for us mm-hmm. gyms are shut joseph you're living it up over in the in the nz new zealand um are, are gyms open for you what's the situation like over there yeah so we we were living it up um but unfortunately not anymore mm. <laughs> so we were covid free here in new zealand um, everything was back to normal, but we got one case of COVID and the whole country went into lockdown. Since then, um, we've been getting more and more cases every day because it's, it's spread. So mm. um, gyms and that are closed here in New Zealand as well, unfortunately. But fingers crossed, we'll be back to normal within maybe three or four weeks. Yeah. But it sucks, you know. Like, I've got equipment at home I can train with. I can still do my workouts. I've got a decent setup. But it's not the same as the gym. Like I like going to the gym with these people. The vibe is there. The environment at home is just so much harder because it's your comfortable place. Mm. You know, even just driving to the gym in your car, it just puts you in a different mm. mindset. Yep. You're somewhere else. You're there to do a job, mm. and that's what I miss, man. Just the the real gym. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're we're kind of in the same situation, I think. Um, I 100% agree with you because for the powerlifting stuff, when you need to visualize lifting big weights and it's kind of, it can intimidate you and you really do need to be in the zone. Like the 30 minute drive to the gym for me was a really good chance to kind of focus and dial in for that session and get the most of it. Whereas like I'm extremely fortunate, fortunate like you are to have the equipment here and still be able to do it, but it's not the same. Like I don't know, it's, it can be difficult to motivate yourself when you don't, yeah, as you say, have that job to do. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And it's just, you know, being your comfortable place as well, like three minutes earlier, you're on the couch mm. yeah. and then you're in the gym. Like you just, I don't know, it's just, you're not, <laughs> you're not in that, that mindset to attack the weights just yet. Mm. Yeah. It's that, it's that mental. But hey, it is what it is. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. Now let's get in right into it here, Gab. So let's explain to our viewers who, who Joseph is, or we'll get Joseph to do it. Male fitness creator. Um, how long have you been making content for Joseph? Um, not sure, but I'd say a long, long time. I would have to say at least at least eleven years now, probably even more than that. Um, but yeah, I've been creating content for pretty much every single social media platform there is. Um, started off on YouTube and Facebook, later on Instagram and all that came and, and now I'm on everything, you know, I'm on Snapchat, I'm on Twitter, I'm on TikTok now and I'm just trying to put my content out there as much as I can um, because, you know, I understand different platforms have different audiences, yeah. um, different platforms, you can build different relationships with different people. For example, on Instagram, someone's just scrolling through you. They double tap like, scroll, double tap like. Mm. But YouTube, if they watch you, they kind of build a bit more of a personal relationship with you. So I believe it's a lot more powerful. But then it's a lot easier to go viral on TikTok. So they all have their their pros and cons. Um, So I use them all. You know, why not? (laughs) Yeah, you put it really well there. Um, They do. And certainly when social media platforms mature, they kind of, they offer less organic exposure like Facebook now is, I don't know, I know you've got a big initial Facebook following, but now you can't grow off Facebook. You need to grow, grow off TikTok. You need to find the latest one. It's just, um, you got to pick and choose like where that trend is and how you're going to grow off it. It's crazy, man. Like I remember years and years ago on Facebook, I post up stuff and it used to get like 20,000, 25,000 likes. <laughs> yeah, Jesus. can't even imagine Now that. it's like if, if I get 5,000, that's like an amazing post. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's it's just they, um, yeah. So like what made you start posting content? Like what was your kind of drive behind it and your reasoning? Yeah, so... Um, I went through a pretty decent transformation myself, I thought, and I, I put that transformation up on bodyboarding.com. Mm-hmm. People started asking me for help and advice with diet and training. I started helping them. Um, and then it got to the point where so many people were help were uh, uh, requesting a meal plan and workout program, sorry, that I decided to you know help them. I was helping them for free, and it got to the point where I thought you know I could charge for the service. Created mm-hmm. a website um, and started offering meal plans and workout programs. I then realized if I want to get more clients, I have to get more exposure. Mm. And the only way to do that was online through creating content and putting out on these different social media platforms. 
So that's why I got into YouTube and, you know, Facebook, Instagram. But I also did it because I enjoyed it. You know, I saw people on YouTube showing what they eat and I found that interesting. And I wanted to show what I eat or show how I train. Um, and I enjoyed the whole content creation space of it. So it's just mm -hmm. something that I enjoyed doing. I didn't see it as a w work or I didn't see it as, you know, me having to do something I didn't want to do. I think I probably would have done it regardless if there was a money incentive behind it or not. Yeah, I think that's pretty similar to like where we came from as well. It's like starts off with all your mates, you know, you're the go-to guy for all the gym information. They're like, oh bro, can you make me like a, a gym workout program? And you're like, oh, of course, man. Like I'd be honored to. And you start sending them a few PDFs and whatnot of like how to get huge arms and whatnot, just like a, a chill, like week long structure or something like that. And then you do realize like more people start asking, you turn it into a business and it's pretty crazy that you can create like a cool, like a living from it essentially. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Where, you know, years ago you couldn't get this exposure and you couldn't create a living from it unless you're a personal trainer in the gym mm. and you couldn't get that exposure unless you're on TV or in a magazine. But now with social media, mm. it gives anyone with a phone and a Wi-Fi connection the opportunity to get exposure. And so we understand that this is your full-time job now and you've created almost like an empire from it. It's pretty commendable in my opinion. Um, in school and early life and things like that, did you consider any other career paths or what was kind of your game plan at that point? And, uh, when I was at school, man, I was, I was an idiot, eh? <laughs> I, I mucked around at school. I basically only went to school to eat my lunch and hang out with my <laughs> friends. Um, I failed school, dropped out early, didn't know what I was going to do with my life. Um, I was just into the party scene. Mm -hmm. um, had no direction. I went and I started working for my dad. My dad owned a food distributing business. Mm -hmm. So I was working for him in a negative 18 degrees freezer all day packing food orders. Nice. It was the worst thing you could imagine. Um, like cleaning toilets probably would have been <laughs> easier. Yeah. It was just terrible, man. Um, but w during that time I was doing that, I found the passion for the gym. And then just by default, because it was my passion, I got into being a personal trainer. Yeah, that's great. Um, I think, yeah, if you're put in a position like that, you kind of realized, oh shit, I want to start working hard so I don't have to end up here for the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did, did When you started, a lot of people go into the gym like with the ambition to kind of improve their sport if they're playing a sport. For us, it's like <laughs> AFL or, or soccer or something like that over here in Australia. Were you ever playing a sport and did you kind of go to the gym to help improve that or was that out of the question? Yep. Um, well, actually, no, but funny you said that because I, I played sports my whole life. I was always into sports, you know, um, really into my soccer or yes. football, as most people call it. Played that for pretty much my whole life, um, you know, top team in first division, Premier League. But once I started, you know, going out with my mates drinking, that kind of phased off. Mm -hmm. um, at school, you know, I loved my cross country. Mm -hmm. I loved anything to do with sports, mm -hmm. except the days when we had weights room. Mm -hmm. Whenever we had weights room, I... I forgot my gym clothes that day. <laughs> I don't know why. I think it was maybe just because I was a skinny kid in the class. I hated lifting weights. I couldn't see the point in lifting weights. It was just like, why would you want to do this? But somehow I, I managed to fall in love with lifting weights and it became my passion. But I never, I never did the gym for um, a specific sports purpose. I kind of started off doing the gym to try and improve my physique. And so when you started out on your journey creating content or even just your when you first started going to the gym and things like that, for us, our inspirations were kind of like you, Zach Perna, Fraser Wilson, Callum Von Moga. When you started your journey, what were your kind of or who were your inspirations? Sorry, I, I missed a little bit of that. It, it seemed to cut out, but I presume you asked me who was my inspirations? That's yeah, right. correct. Yeah. Yep. Um, lucky I got the end of that. <laughs> so oh, I've looked up to many people, you know. Um, obviously, Arnold looked up to him, Frank Zane, Serge Nubray, a lot of those old school bodybuilders, just because the way their physique looked, the classic look, the lifestyle that they lived when it came to the gym. Mm. Um, but I also was inspired by a lot of guys like 
those, you know, Greg Plitt. Um, rest in peace to him as he has passed away. But just guys like that that I found through, I guess it was YouTube at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I would say Greg Plitt, the old school bodybuilders, Arnold. Um, and then you, you might, guys might be familiar with this guy. His name was Kane Summerbat. Um, he was one of my early inspirations. You don't? Mm. Uh, I think on Instagram he's Timberwolf. I don't, no, don't follow him too closely now, but in the early days, um, he was someone I, I followed pretty closely. Were there any big YouTubers or big fitness YouTubers when you started your journey? Um, to be honest, no. I don't think there was. Like, not when I started anyway. Not that I can think of. I know Greg Plitt was on YouTube, but it wasn't really like his life or anything like that. It was more like just motivational videos from him. Yeah, okay. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't actually think there was any like YouTube vloggers in the fitness space. Yeah, that's crazy. There probably was, but not that I was following, yeah. Because I think when obviously you started very early when YouTube came about, so you would have been one of the pioneers of kind of the fitness scene and content and things like that. So that's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's 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 been a fun journey, you know? <laughs> and so I remember when I was following your content really closely and soaking up all the tips and information you'd uh, convey out there you were really big on the ketogenic diet for um one for people who were very overweight and needed to drastically cut weight but also for yourself to get really shredded to improve focus and things like that i implemented it into my own lifestyle is it still something you really promote and believe in 100 percent. i love keto and i think keto is one of the best diets out there mm-hmm. um i'll quickly explain why now when it comes to fat loss Obviously, it's calories in versus calories out. If you're on a keto diet here or a diet here that contains carbohydrates, if calories are equal, the calorie deficit is equal, fat loss will be equal. But the reason, you know, I've dieted, I've got shredded on keto, and I've got shredded shredded on, you know, a high-carb diet that was in a calorie deficit. But the reason I like keto is because it has so many amazing benefits. When you're dieting, obviously, calories have to be low. When you bring calories low, you usually have to remove it from somewhere, usually carbohydrates. When carbohydrates are low and you're just getting a little bit of carbs, you feel like shit. You've got energy, then you crash. You've got energy, then you crash. Keto, on the other hand, because you've just removed all the carbs and your body's running off fat and ketones instead, I find even when calories are low, I don't have that energy crash. My energy is just constantly high and sustained. I'm also... I don't have any brain fog. I'm very productive. Um, I just feel like I get heaps done. Um, I don't have that bloatedness feeling because I'm not consuming so much carbohydrates, mass amounts of fiber. Um, And I just feel really lean and tight because another thing that the keto diet does, because there's no insulin or low amounts of insulin, your kidneys don't hold on to as much salt and sodium. Mm. It flushes all that water out. So you lose a lot of weight. So you actually look leaner, which is motivating. And when you see yourself looking leaner, you stick to the diet more. (laughs) And the reason I promote the keto diet so much to most of my clients is because there's, it's easier to adhere to. Mm. Now, I've had over 155,000 clients worldwide. So I've got a lot of data on my clients and what diets they stick to most. And keto smashes it out of the park. And I think I know that why. When you're following a diet that contains carbohydrates, you know, the weekend comes, you're out with your friends, um, oh, maybe I'll get that burger and fries. It's just one meal. Yeah. You know, or you're out at a party, you'll grab some chips, etc., etc., and you break it and you fall off. Mm. But when you're on the keto diet, there's such a line in the sand. <laughs> yeah. It's like, hey, do you, do you want, like, you can't have carbs. <laughs> so when you go out for dinner, instead of getting the burger and fries, you end up getting steak and butter or steak yeah. and veggies. And if someone tries to give you some chips, you're kind of like, oh, no, I can't because it'll, it'll kick me out of the ketosis state. Yeah. Mm. So what ends up happening is you actually, my, my clients anyway, they actually stick to the diet longer, yeah. which gets them the results. Yeah. Not to mention when you're on a normal diet that contains carbs, you don't see a massive change right away. But on the keto diet, because you lose so much water weight, mm. sometimes in the first week, my clients lose three to five kgs of water weight. Mm. 
So when they see they drop three to five kgs in one week, yeah. they're like, holy shit, <laughs> this diet's amazing. I'm going to stick to it. <laughs> it's that initial momentum they need to keep going. Yes, exactly. It's that initial momentum that keeps them going. And, you know, a lot of my clients, they feel just so amazing on the keto diet because they've got like this new energy where they're eating massive amounts of carbs before and they feel sluggish, tired, lethargic. Now they just feel so much better. They've got more energy. That's why I like the keto, just because there's so many benefits compared to a diet with carbohydrates. And saying that though, 90% of the time, my own diet is a very high carb diet, like 500 grams plus. Mm. Um, I'm a big carb guy. Even when dieting, a lot of the time, I will have carbs in my diet. But if I'm trying to get super shredded and calories have to be low, I need to go keto, otherwise yeah. I feel like shit. <laughs> and I think when you you are excluding carbs as your as a macronutrient and you're relying on fats and protein, the diet is also a lot more satiating because you can down carbs like no tomorrow, whereas protein is very satiating. Like if you eat 500 grams, or sorry, like 500 calories worth of protein as opposed to carbs, you're probably going to be a whole lot more full and that'll result in kind of less binge eating and, you know, grabbing the chips from the cupboard and things like that and just putting away calories like not... No, tomorrow, because there's just, yeah, as you said, there's only so much food you can eat, and it's like either you yeah. cheat on your diet completely and you're not doing keto, um, but yeah, I don't know, it's, it, I find it difficult to stick to, particularly for powerlifting, um, it just doesn't go hand in hand with one another, because you do need so many carbs to fuel your glycogen stores and everything like that, um, I, what the research I've done, you kind of need to stick below 50 grams of carbs per day to be in ketosis. Is there a specific number or a rule of thumb that you try to stick to for to be in ketosis? Yeah, I think under 50 grams is is a good rule to follow as well. Obviously, everyone's different. A bigger person may be able to get away with more. Mm. But, you know, if it's 50 grams you've got to stay under, it's not like you should try and hit that 50 grams. Like, it should be all indirect sources of carbs. Yeah, yeah. Like, you wouldn't have 30 grams of carbs from oats. <laughs> um, like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah. Again, baby. <laughs> yeah, but I'm under 50 grams. Yeah. Like, it's no direct carbs. It's just trace carbs that um, you get in your diet. So, I think if, as long as you're just doing trace carbs and you stand at 50, for the most part, you're going to be in a ketosis state, especially if you're training hard and, and burning a lot of calories anyway. And fruits and veggies. And also, like, yeah, fruits and veggies, they've got carbs in it. Is it. Are you still able to integrate fruits and veggies into your keto diet? Yeah, so not fruits because yeah. um, that'll kick out of ketosis, but mm. fruits such as avocado, yes, even mm. though it does have some carbohydrates, uh, those are fine. A um, little bit of berries here and there, but I don't really do that myself. Mm. Um, so, yeah. For the most part, veggies are all right. Um, I look at them as trace carbs, but just don't just don't be excessive on it mm. and eat like kgs and kgs of veggies. Sounds like my kind of diet, mate. I would uh, I do not like fruit and veggies, so it would work like a charm. When did you first start doing keto, Joseph? Or like when did it kind of come to fruition for you? Oh, it must have been, oh, don't know, at least seven, eight years ago now. Mm. Um, I've done it many, many times. But yeah, like I said, 90% of the time I am on a, a high carb diet, like more high carb than the majority of people. Um, but if my calories are low, keto is the way to go. Just because of the appetite suppressing thing it has, you know, it takes away all of your cravings. You got your hunger is gone. Mm. But when you are having a little bit of carbohydrate, it spikes the insulin and it makes you hungry and it makes you want more carbs and it makes a diet very hard. One thing that we've really taken from you is the business and the empire you've created for yourself. We've noticed you've got multiple income streams. It's, it's definitely something to strive for. And at a young age, we're quite, quite savvy in terms of finance and investing and things like that. So I think it's definitely something to look up to with what you've created. Uh, do you want to talk us through like what your business is and how you kind of afford your living, your cool cars and everything like that? Yeah, so I've, I've got a few businesses um, in the fitness and in the software space. So Joseph Rackets Fitness is my online training and online coaching business. Um, I've got my own mobile app, which provides meal plans and workout programs to people all around the world. Mm -hmm. We've had more than 155,000 clients worldwide. Um, every meal plan, every workout program is 100% customized to the client, their goals, what they're trying to achieve. 
I've got a big team. Um, the team helps me with marketing. I've got managers. I've got video guys that fill my videos, edit my videos. I've got a customer support team. Um, we've got the works. Another one of the companies I own is Macroactive. And what we do at Macroactive is we build websites and we develop mobile apps for other online trainers, such as myself or another online trainer. And then our team helps them grow and scale their online training and online coaching business. Um, we've got more than 200 trainers there. We've done more than 40 million in revenue from all of our trainers combined. Mm. Uh, the other business I own is IIFYM.com. So I recently, or me and my two business partners, we recently bought that uh, from a guy in America. Basically, this website, you guys are probably familiar with IIFYM, it means if it fits your macros. Mm -hmm. this, this website gets 6,500 unique views per day um, from Google search to people to the website uh, looking for meal plans and workout programs. Or meal plans, I should say. Yeah. So we sell them there on custom meal plans in regards to their macros. Um, aside from that, I invest in property. I invest in land, um, crypto, NFTs. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, that, and that's about it. And you've also stage. got your supplement and apparel line, I remember as well. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, I forgot about that. <laughs> Just to remind <laughs> you, mate. Sorry. Don't forget <laughs> any there, mate. <laughs> so yeah, I got, my own supplement, I got my own supplement line as well. Um, we, I did have a clothing line. It was actually my brother's clothing line. Um, and I was, you know, promoting it for him. We didn't do too mm. well. Uh, we kind of got it. Well, he got in a little bit of debt. Um, so I bought the business off him for $1. <laughs> <laughs> I took the debt and then I pretty much just gave all the clothing away, um, to all the GF clients. Um, took a loss, but Hey, you know, it was, it was good. I, I gave a lot of stuff away. But yeah, my supplement business is doing pretty well. We've got a pre-workout, we've got a fat burner, and we're going to bring out a whole line of supplements eventually. That's awesome. Like, as 23-year-olds, I think it's important to kind of be aware of, you know, you need money to fund the lifestyle that you want. Like, for us, we want to have families, and we want to be able to support them and everything like that. And I think what you've done... It's well, it just shows like the diversification yeah. and what you need to do to diversify. I think that's like pretty amazing. Some of those numbers are incredible, Joseph. I saw one of your posts a while ago. You talked about how you've put about one and a half million dollars into into just ad, like Facebook ad revenue or just ads. <laughs> how, how, how does that work, mate? Like, have you been doing Facebook ads <laughs> for ages or because we do a few Facebook ads. We're not quite at those numbers yet, though, mate. What do we need to be doing? Yeah, um, we've put a lot of money into advertising. Obviously, it's working. We're getting good return on it, but um, you know, sometimes you have to spend money to make more money. Mm. In regards to marketing, though, I don't know much about it. I'm not a marketer myself. I'm good on the organic side of stuff. Yeah. You know, creating content, doing call to actions, sending people to our email list, catching leads. But I've got an amazing marketing team. Um, you know, I've had a few guys work for me. They they're just so amazing, you know. They they're they're the levers behind my business. Yeah. They they drive it, and without them, I wouldn't be doing the numbers that that I'm doing. So and it's important yeah. to realize that you can't do everything yourself. You need people that specialize in certain areas. Like for us, our business is nowhere near the size of yours, but it supports our living for the time being. And we've got people who handle our email marketing, marketing assistants to help with the Instagram stuff, some software people. You just can't do it all yourself. And if you do try, you're going to stress yourself out and it probably won't be as good and you're not going to have a fun time doing it. 100%. Like, you know, I, I try to learn Facebook ads, but the amount of time and effort that I'd have to spend learning and understanding and trying to nail it, it just made so much more sense. Hiring someone who's extremely experienced in it yeah. and can just execute at a high level. Yeah, yeah. and twice <laughs> um, fast. Yeah, and that's same with you know videos. Like I, I used to film my own videos and then try and edit them. I never ever done it before in my life. It was the hardest thing, and I just spent too long doing it. So I was like, okay, I need to get someone that can film me and edit my videos. Yeah. So it takes that that job away from me. Yeah. And once I've done that, it's just I've been a pump content. I think the coolest thing for us is when you do have a successful business and you do have these income streams performing, 
you're able to kind of buy cool things like we're at the stage now where we want to buy a new car and things like that or two new cars you've got some pretty cool ones you've got a lambo i think you've got a truck as well you've bought like a a pink range rover for your wife um talk us through cars we love cars we just want to have a chat about it yeah man i'm i love my cars as well like I was never like the boy racer, um, you know, I don't know too much about cars, but I just appreciate nice cars, um, such as your yeah. supercars and all that, you know, I've always, I've always had the dream of, you know, one day owning a Lamborghini, I remember I used to take pictures of standing next to them and said, you know, one day I'm going to get this, um, and it's just been a goal that I've been working hard to, hard to achieve, um, so yeah, it was, it was pretty awesome when I was able to purchased my first Lamborghini um, it was a pretty surreal moment because I just felt like you know I've been yeah. working for this so long um, yeah it was just such a good feeling to know that I accomplished something that I set out to do and yeah I'm just my next car that I want is the Cybertruck from yeah, Tesla yeah, 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 I'm not sure yeah. if you guys seen it but it looks like that big that big <laughs> Lego toy <laughs> Uh, I think that'd be pretty cool. So yeah, that, that's, that's the next thing I want. Every of every single supercar, which is the one that Joseph has? What do you mean? Which, which, which what, Lambo? What, so he's got the um, Hurricane at the moment, but you started with a Gallardo or Gallardo, however you pronounce it. When did you first get a Gallardo? Yep. Was that like, how many years ago was that? <sighs> I don't know, but uh, I'm, I'm 30 now. I think I got oh. it around 23. Oh, that's our that. age. Um, <laughs> We've got a bit of work to do. Yeah. <laughs> 20, 23, 24, I think it was around there. Um, and I, I had it for quite some time. And then, yeah, I got the Huracan oof, maybe two years ago, three, yeah. three years ago now. We maybe? were there when Man, you got the Huracan um, on, uh, on Snapchat and stuff. So we were watching from afar. We didn't know we'd be doing oh, an you interview were? with you oh, after. Wicked. But yeah, the, which one's your favorite? Do you, is there a noticeable difference between the two? Or is it just more refined? Yeah, the Huracan is it's, yeah, it's mm. quite a few steps up. Um, beautiful car to drive. I, I haven't taken it to the track yet. I've been invited a few times. We've got a track here yep. in New Zealand that we can, you know, take them around. Um, so I've got to take it there one day and just really feel yeah, the power yeah. of it, you know? Like, what's it like filling up a V10 every day? Does it does it get to you or it's just all part of it? It's all part of it, you know. I guess you have to expect that. Um, it's not cheap and, it, and it, you can almost see yeah, it yeah, yeah. going down when you're driving. <laughs> But, you know, it's, I look at it this way. You only live once, so I, I want to enjoy my life and live it to the fullest, and I, well, I enjoy driving now, it. The age that you got your first Lambo, I'm thinking about potentially an RS3, an Audi RS3. Mm. You're thinking about a Land Cruiser. Yeah, I was going to go like something nice and quick, but I think a Land Cruiser just fits me a little bit better. We've, we've Mum and Dad have one, and I'm lucky enough to drive, and it just works better to my lifestyle. Uh, the RS3, though... That'll be fun. That's pretty quick. Yeah. We're not quite at Lambo territory yeah, yet. Yeah, not though. Lambo yet. I'm trying to get the cheapest, quickest, coolest thing I can get. <laughs> but yeah, that's where I'm at. I'd like a Lambo one day. Yeah. Maybe the Urus. Yeah, yeah. So, so is it is it the Cyber Cyber Truck next? Yeah. And then are we? Let's go to the moon. We go on Bugattis. What what's what's after that? Yeah, I'd love a Bugatti, but I heard um, you can't get them in New Zealand. Something There's something like with their door, it <laughs> doesn't fit the requirements um, to be legal yeah. here on the New Zealand roads. Um, I think it's got no safety thing or something, so if someone yeah. crashes into you from the side, something like that anyway. Um, but yeah, so, I'd, I'd love to have a Bugatti. I'm sure yeah, there's I'm some sure work around, around So it. money's not an option, or money's not an issue. What's your dream car? What are you going? Uh... I'd have to probably say some yeah. type of Bugatti. Sure. Um, sure, yeah. yeah, I'm not not sure what one exactly, but yeah, I'd probably say yeah. Bugatti. Go, it's kind of just that large. top pinnacle, you know? Yeah. yeah. It'll be comfy on the New Zealand roads as well. I think it'll work. Gab, what's yours? Are oh, you just going an M3? Oh, M4 probably. M4, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd say. But I think what Joseph has highlighted here, and for like the modern day kind of person earning income... Like the traditional format is you go to uni, you get a job and your job is kind of your only form of income. Like mm. you can invest in property and all that stuff like that and have some passive income as well. But I think it's really important these days to diversify your income so you can, you know, buy cool Lambos and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're, you're all, what I think is pretty admirable that you do is like you, you're searching for the next kind of way. You're not, you're not satisfied. Like I've seen 
you've been doing a lot of digging with your NFTs, some um, investing there. I'm, I've done some research on it. I'm not sure I'm entirely convinced with it just yet, but I think what's pretty cool what you do is you're always looking for the next option, like growing and things like that. Yeah, I, and it's what I love, you know. I think just, you know, part of my nature is who I am. I like to see where the trends are. I like to see what people are doing. And that, that's what kind of got me into this NFT space. It was just like where the, where the people were going, what was the latest thing? Why were people wanting to pay so much for a certain NFT? Yeah. And then I understood, oh, it's ownership. You own this one. Um, it's a status yeah. thing. It's a flex. Yeah. And why are they worth so much? It's supply and demand. And it's human behavior, you know? Why do we spend $4,000 on a Gucci bag when we can get one... Yeah. For 40 mm -hmm. bucks from Kmart, it's because status and flex almost, you know, you're, you're trying to communicate to other people, you know, and it's the same with NFTs, except now NFTs, you can put it as your Twitter pick and it, instead of just showing your friends and your family, now yeah, anyone in the world can see. You've got like big dogs <laughs> it's, like Logan it's just, Paul and Gary V. like as soon as they make moves like that, everyone gets on the hype on. train. And it's almost like this artificial bubble that yeah. we create. The more people wanting it and the more hype around it and the bigger of a flex it is, the more it drives the price up, which is, I think, like I agree from it, but from that perspective, my question is how long does it keep going for and is the hype going to die out and things like that? I'm, I'm not entirely convinced, but I can 100% see the value in it. Yeah, and you're so right. You know, There's, there's so yeah. many different NFT projects what decides the price? It's pretty much the market that decides the price. Um, a lot of the NFT projects out there will go to zero. They will be worth nothing. You know, a lot of people are probably going to spend a decent amount of money and not be able to sell it and get stuck holding the bag. Like a lot of people are going to lose money. That's why you always got to do your homework. You got to do your research. You got to see where the demand is. You got to see what people want. Um, and yeah, it's just. Trying to find that one percent. Is that the same one that Logan Paul? Like that's the that's the main hype train, isn't it? Yeah, the two biggest NFTs for like yeah. the profile picture potential ones, anyway, is the CryptoPunks yeah, well, and the Bored Apes. That's like the. Have you seen everyone with like those eight profile pictures? Yeah. Wearing like, oh yeah. Like a, oh yeah, I think so. Yes. I'm, I'm a bit lost. So yeah. essentially, for everyone who doesn't yeah. know what NFT is, uh, this I'm no expert, but it's like pretty much the blockchain determines like you have a unique piece of artwork or something like yeah, that you and you're the only one that owns that and for something like the board ape there's only like a limited amount of board apes in different designs some are in higher demand than others but when you got people like logan paul and stuff buying it yeah. and trading it and all the phase clan members and all of that and there's only so many left it just drives the price up oh i want it. it's going to be yeah, worth yeah, more yeah, kind yeah, of thing yeah. it's like almost like a trading card but like you it is Mm -hmm. like completely finite and the blockchain determines how many or the code or the technology behind it determines how many there are in existence mm. um joseph do you have anything to add there or have i made any mistakes <laughs> yeah no you, you pretty much nailed it bang on and you know like it is it comes down to how much will people pay for it so the board apes for example i think the floor mm. price which means the cheapest one right now is around 40 <laughs> ethereum without calculating that i think that's around yeah. 150,000 maybe. <laughs> um, and, and it's like, wow, someone will pay this much for an image? And they will because eventually yeah, someone's probably yeah. going to pay 180,000 for that because they want to yeah. be, they want to own that. So it's a, just understand it's a crazy yeah, it world is. we and live I in right now. <laughs> the danger is there are a lot of these other projects that try to mimic what they do and there's other people, it, the, the floor price is lower. But yeah, obviously the hype isn't as big and are they just going to die out and lose all their money? That's the mm. thing that, yeah, it, it is a bit risky. Mm -hmm. um, yep. I think we'll Very go risky, and chat yeah. a bit more about the kind of fitness content and the rise of Joseph Rakic. Um, do you want to chat to us a little bit about like what you found were the best ways to grow when you started out, like in terms of platforms for nowadays, like when we started out, we grew off TikTok. What was it for you back then? Yep. To be honest, it was using all the platforms, um, but I really, I really grew my exposure on mm. Snapchat. When Snapchat first came around, uh, my manager was like, hey, Joseph, get on Snapchat. And I was like, mate, I'm not going to get on Snapchat. It's just like yeah. for 14-year-old girls. Like, what am I going to do on it? And he's like, no, nah, man, get on Snapchat. I eventually got on Snapchat, and I used to post my workouts. 
you know, take a video of each exercise that I did, post up how much sets, reps, um, put it up there, and people that were following me liked this, this content. They would screenshot it, they would save it, they would try my workouts, and I guess they just shared it with their friends, and it, it just grew and grew and grew. And that kind of gave me more exposure to those people finding my other social media channels. Um, but yeah, I think every social media platform has its time and place. Like on Facebook, you know, there was one point where I was going up, like, I honestly think it was more than 5,000 mm. people per day. Wow. Yeah. Followers. Um, n- now on Facebook, yeah, yeah, I'm losing yeah. them almost. <laughs> My Snapchat was growing. Snapchat's not anymore. It's just, it's almost like everything goes through phases. Yeah. Same as Instagram. Um, I used to, sorry, I just got a call. S- same with Instagram. It used to grow so easy and so fast, and now it's just hit like a plateau. Uh, TikTok, I'm getting good yeah. good traction there now, so I'm I'm trying to drive the That's content so there. Interesting, and something I am kind of obsessed with, or really interests me, is like when like I remember before we started posting content, I'd post an Instagram story and get 400 views, and I'd be like, dude, that's 400 people viewing my story. That's pretty sick. Mm. Now we're getting 10 to 15,000 views on an Instagram story, which I think is pretty cool. It's probably nowhere near your numbers. But can you give us like some ballpark estimates of like how many people are viewing your Snapchat stories and Instagram stories? Because to me, like that's really powerful. If you can have X amount of people viewing your stories, like that's an amount of people you can influence. What were your kind of numbers then? Back then, I can't remember. My story views now, they're pretty terrible, man. Um, it's probably around forty to yeah. fifty five thousand I get on average, um, which is you know not good yeah. for my size I don't think. Snapchat is weird, like it's usually low, but then randomly yeah. all of a sudden you'll get like you know four hundred thousand plus, <laughs> and it's like why 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 is this you know? Um, but yeah, you know everything's an algorithm. If you're posting too much. I think yeah. sometimes it's a bad thing as well because it's seen as spam and I, I do that a lot. And I, like, the social media platform wants you to stay on the platform. So it's trying to put the best content to all of its users. So if I put something up on my story and most people watching are just skipping or swipe to the next story, Instagram recognizes this mm. is not good content. So next time I post, I'll probably be further yeah. in that person's feed yeah. because they skipped me. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's weird yeah. these little signals that the uh, you send to the algorithm and that determines. It's it's a strange little word. I wish I understood what the code was. In you there. can't even begin to understand it. Like we've tried before and then it's like a random video will just do really well. It's like, I, I have no idea why. Yeah. You know, it was interesting talking to Fraser Wilson last week. He uploads all his stuff at once because he thinks that like it'll have higher engagement because people are more likely to click through on that and may signal to the algorithm that it's good content kind of thing. So it's really interesting to see different creative strategies behind that. Mm, interesting, yeah. And I see what he means, you know, especially if yeah. it's a workout. Yeah, definitely. What about in terms of like, obviously a lot of your life is through social media and it's probably on your phone. Do you, do, do you implement any strategies to make sure you're not on your phone all the time and, and kind of get away from that? <laughs> no, I don't. To be honest, um, I know a lot of people. Yeah. I know a lot of people that do, but I think you know. I think if you put that barrier barrier up, when you don't have that barrier up, you just want to be yeah. on it all the time, um, because you feel like you can be on it now. Because so I, I just I don't set any rules, and I just I kind of just go with the flow, and I I not try to. I don't try to, yeah, make any. Have rules you ever been that, in really? like a in kind of a mindset where you're really affected by the views and the likes and the comments you're getting? Like, have it has it has it, has it ever affected you? Yeah, I guess it has. You know, like sometimes you see, you know, on Facebook it used to be so much, and then you said mm. less and less likes. I'm like, Fuck, yeah. why is this? Like, I'm sure this content's good, but now I kind of just ignore it. Um, it is what it is. I understand it's an algorithm understand you know at the end of the yeah. day they're just likes i as long as i'm putting out good content some people are going to like it you know 100 people is better than none so i try not to get too caught up in it but i think everyone does to some degree 
um, because you're always like, oh, it's almost like you put something up to try and get more likes, more than yeah, more yeah. sales or something. Fit, I suppose the, the difficult <laughs> side of that yeah, is sometimes so- if you are a, an influencer um, or you sell your business through online things is like there is a direct correlation with the, the, the money you make is, is kind of how well that post does. What kind of, what's have you found is like your best kind of content? What does the best for you? Hmm. Uh, a few things. So my workout videos do extremely well. People like that because I'm providing good yeah. content that provides value. Um, also funny mm. videos. For example, if it's like a, a funny video on TikTok in relation to the gym, that'll go super well because everyone shares it, everyone tags. They do better than anything, but I would probably say my my workout videos are the best because that gets mm. the most saves. Um, and I think that provides the in most value. Action, yeah, pictures now yeah. they're pretty in terms pretty of average. Creating the content yourself, like, uh, like what kind of equipment do you use? Is it just I don't think it's just on an iPhone, but are you just like, is it a certain type of camera, or you edit it on a certain type of software? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know what though. <laughs> That's my camera guy. <laughs> um, I think my camera guy, Sony, wouldn't be able to tell you what camera it is. Um, but yeah, he does all my filming, all my editing. I don't even know what he edits on. It does uh, just so yeah, yeah. yeah. I wouldn't it tell you if I knew. Like, we've had the, the privilege of talking to some pretty um, like you know, well equipped and 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 somewhat famous influencers over the last couple of weeks, and no one has like a set plan. No one has like a, there's not like a set way to do it. Everyone does things differently. So I don't know if you are thinking about getting started at home, it is just about posting, isn't it? Yeah. Get started and figure out your own way. Just use an iPhone or something, I think. And obviously when you do yeah. develop like a big following, you do get certain opportunities and people offering to sponsor you. I know you're kind of, um, I, I don't think there's any obvious sponsors there, but uh, do you like, I think you've kind of like with your own supplement line and things like that, but, when did you first start getting sponsors and things like that? Yeah, so my, my first main yeah. sponsor was EHP Labs. Um, they helped me out a lot. You know, they flew me around the world, um, different expos, different fitness shows. Uh, but right now, I don't have any sponsors. I just focus on my own content, my, my own supplement brand. Um, because obviously with a sponsor, you have yeah. to promote them, you have to tag them. And I, I spam my audience enough with my own stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I don't, I don't take on any sponsorships at the moment, but EHP Labs was one of the best things that I've done because it helped me helped me grow as a mm. brand um, and it just gave me so much more exposure. Yeah. So in terms of like like expos and stuff, I've, I've, we, we've kind of chatted to our sponsors about expos and, and that sort of thing. What's it like? I mean, I'm, it's very specific, but going to expos and stuff, do you, do you set up for the day and then people come and say g'day? Like what's the, what's the go? Yeah, so when I was with EHP Labs, um, we did different expos all around the world, Vegas, Australia, UK, and basically they would have their booth there. At the booth would be the EHP Labs athletes. Um, People would come along for photos, Mm. for taste testing the supplements. There might be like some competition going on, like push-up challenge or pull-up comp. Everyone would partake, and it's just basically a a cool time to mix with the crowd, chat, take photos. Yeah, it's fantastic. yeah, I hope one day we get to do that. Surely, surely. It'll be great. It'll be great fun. Now, with all of that, obviously, um, with all the good comes a, a bit of bad. Uh, being Having such a presence on social media, do you, I know we sometimes get some pretty odd messages, some pretty pretty funny stuff. Have you ever had to deal with like any aggressive hate or any aggressive messages or weird messages? Yeah, all the time, you know, and I think it's just something that as humans there's always you know we're not perfect so there's always going to be those people trying to bring you down but you just have to just ignore it you know like i i couldn't imagine myself going to someone else's profile that i don't know and just like commenting something so negative like oh i I hate you you're (laughs) such a blah 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 i could never imagine me doing that so i kind of feel sorry for them that they're they're like feeling that way to have so much anger inside of them to do that so yeah, um, I just yeah, ignore it, you know. I've noticed in Australia, there's a lot of people, I don't know, maybe because we're young and we've got good physiques, like there are a lot of people that try to bring you down and almost get like a bit intimidated and, you know, a fair amount of hate gets thrown to us, whereas I think in America, it wouldn't be so much because it's kind of normalized there. There's a lot more of a bodybuilding culture. 
I don't know what it is about it, but yeah, dealing with hate is a big one. You can't let it affect you too much. Mm. Yeah. Otherwise, it would just it just ruin it for you. You know, if you see it, just ignore and move forward. Focus on the positives only. In terms of your own training, you definitely focus on more of a bodybuilding style. Have you ever trialed any other styles or what is it that makes you always gravitate towards the bodybuilding style? Yeah, I've tried I've tried pretty much everything there is. But I, I just love the bro splits, you know? Chest once a week, back once a week, arms once a week, legs once a week. It's just what I enjoy because I can train at high volume. I know, okay, I'm training chest today. I'm just going in there and smashing chest as hard as I can. I've trained it twice per week, three times per week, but when I'm doing the bro split at high volume, those are the best and most enjoyable I workouts I have. Enjoy it, you're going to stick to it more. And like, there are definitely certain arguments against the bro split. I know we prefer an upper lower split, particularly for powerlifting and things like that. But at the end of the day, if you're not going to be able to stick to it, then there's no point in you doing it. So the big fact of the matter is you enjoy it and that's kind of what's going to keep you going. Mm. Hundred yeah, percent. Like yeah. It's, once you figure out what you like, then you kind of stick to it, don't you, Gab? Like exactly that's, right. It, it, yeah. Don't try and think too much into it. And you know, obviously, Joseph's pretty jacked, so it's worked for him. Yeah. And you know, that that style works for everyone, doesn't it? <laughs> now, in terms of goals for the future and things like that, is there anything on the horizon? Yeah, I just want to grow Joseph Rogers Fitness as much as I can. Um, you know, I've helped 155,000 clients worldwide. My goal is to help a million clients worldwide. Uh, it's going to be a lot of work to do that, but I know it's possible and I'm going to keep pushing forward and, until, I, until I reach Any that. Any travel opportunities coming up? I know New Zealand and Australia are kind of locked up and there isn't much, but, you know, EHP Labs have flown you around the world. Is there any yeah. cards for that? Uh, no travel at the moment, but, you know, as soon as... Um, Borders open up and the world's back to normal. Yeah. I want to do a lot of travel, man. Uh, travel is what I love, what I enjoy. So as soon as I can travel properly without having to do like a two-week quarantine here in New Zealand, Amazing. I'll be traveling a lot. Always helps yeah, getting content as well. People content. love to see travel on social media, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't have anything else. Joseph, do you have any anything else you want to add? Fantastic. No, nope, not from me. Um, it was a great podcast, guys. I really enjoyed speaking to you. Um, and then you guys from Australia, right? Next, next time over in next time I'm over in Australia, or Melbourne. Um, I used to come over like two to three oh. times a, a year. So next time I'm over, um, we'll have oh, to that, connect yeah, and we'll have a workout. Do that. That will uh, that'll make our year. No, for sure. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate <laughs> it. Um, yeah, this has been amazing, and I can't wait to show our viewers. Awesome. Thanks, Joseph. Cheers, mate. Likewise. Cheers. Looking forward to it.